Well, I hope you enjoyed that intro as much as I did. Nothing I enjoy quite uh, like staring at, at snakes. I, I don't know how you are. I, I don't consider myself to be uh, an absolute, like, I, I don't have this profound phobia of snakes, but there's never been a moment where I was around a snake, there was something going on uh, in, in my life that I had to deal with a snake that I was ever like, you know what, I kind of enjoy this. This is a lot of fun. I think I would like to do this more often. Uh, if you've ever wondered, and I get this question a lot, what do pastors do all week long? You know, because they see us on Sunday, you know, I stand up here and I, I preach, and so people are often like, what do, you, what do you do the rest of the week? You like sit in your office, play checkers, what's going on? I want to tell you what pastors do uh, throughout the rest of the week. This has been a couple of weeks ago, and Carl Lynch comes into my office, and he's got a bit of a frantic look in his eye, and uh, Carl says, Jason, we've got to go help somebody, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, something's going wrong, marriage, family, what, what is it? He's like, uh, uh, a lady called, uh, she's been a member here for a lot of years, uh, and sh she has a snake in her house, and her kids are not available, and she needs us to come take care of it. And so we, we show up to her house, and she's sitting outside in her vehicle with the door shut. Uh, the house door is shut, and the snake is all the way on the other end of her house in the laundry room. And she's like, get it out. She, I mean, just get it out. So she's got tools. Carl and I each take a weapon, and two grown men, not so boldly, march our way down the hall into where the uh, hot water tank was, uh, and we found the snake. Two Grown men, one small snake. Logically, this is not a problem. I mean, it, it, was, it was a rat snake. It wasn't even poisonous. What's the big deal? Uh, without ever actually speaking this to each other, Carl and I were both a little bit terrified. You know, uh, two grown men, one small snake. We were a little bit terrified. We did our best to get the snake out of the house, and uh, we did. We scared it enough to make it go out the hole it came in. We did not pick the snake up. We didn't remove it from the house ourselves. But we felt pretty good because we did our good deed and we didn't get hurt. Now, if you're uncomfortable around snakes, it's because I believe God ordained that. I believe God would intend for you to be afraid, that he would want you to stay away. I think it's no coincidence that in the Garden of Eden, uh, Eve was misled by a serpent. There's nothing good that could ever come from a snake. I think you'll largely agree. Now today, we're starting a new series called The Snake in the Garden. And what we're going to be looking at is the, the topic of spiritual warfare and what it looks like. Um, uh, first of all, who our enemy is, how our enemy operates, kind of the front on which we fight the battle, what it looks like for us to engage in spiritual warfare. And I'm going to be honest with you, today we're just going to kind of tip our toes in the water. I'm not going to give you everything the Bible has to say about spiritual warfare. I, I won't get it done in the next four weeks. But today, I want to give you kind of an introduction to what it looks like um, to enter into spiritual warfare. Now, there's, there's two common things I've seen in Christianity. I'll be honest, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and there was this day where everyone was going to be a spiritual warrior. Everywhere people looked, there was a devil behind a tree, a demon behind every circumstance. If you had a bad day, that was demonic, and you needed to renounce that bad day. I mean, that was like, and, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like these people are so obsessed with demons. I wonder if they think about Jesus, you know? So there is this side of things where we could get so obsessed uh, with spiritual warfare that we really miss out on the life of Christ. Now, again, there's a right way to fight this battle. You should know what's going on. You should understand that the enemy is at work in this world. And in the same way that Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it to the full, he pointed out to us that there is an enemy, there is a deceiver, there is the devil here in this world who wishes to steal and to kill and to destroy. He wants to do it to you and to your family, and to your friends, to cultures and nations as a whole. He wants to lead them away from Christ. And so if we just want to define spiritual warfare, it's basically uh, the things that happen in opposition to the work of Jesus Christ in this world. And so it may be thoughts. It might be attitudes. It might be prevailing cultural beliefs. It might be very specific actions that are hostile to the work of God in this world world. And, and here's the thing that I would want you to know. There are some people who get a little bit obsessed, and maybe they go overboard. But what I think is even more dangerous are people who are apathetic 
people who pretend like we're not really in a war. I, I call this cruise ship Christianity. Men and women who think, what I'm going to do is I'm going to like pray to God. I want to be a believer. I want to follow after Jesus Christ. I, I'm going to call myself a Christian. We'll pray before meals. And really what I want out of life is for God to make the sailing smooth and the ride easy. It's like riding on a, a cruise ship, right? You got a lounge chair and a drink with an umbrella, nice sunshine. You hope the sea's really smooth. You just get to enjoy. Listen, I do hope that you enjoy your life. But Jesus Christ would, would came um, not just to hang out on this earth. The example of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who we pattern our lives after, he came to suffer and die on our behalf. He came to push back the work of darkness in this world. And if we're going to follow Jesus Christ, it's not going to be in cruise ship Christianity. As a matter of fact, we, uh, the, the form that Paul would have us take on is that of a soldier. That we should understand that we're in a battle. That every day is going to be a fight. If we're going to follow after Jesus Christ, it's not cruise ship Christianity. But instead, we should see ourselves as soldiers in the kingdom of of God. So I want to speak to you uh, about the battle that we're ultimately in, what it looks like, who we fight, how it functions. If you, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to be in chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Now, in Ephesians, in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, he's been speaking to them about who they are in Christ. This is where we get uh, the, the big but that we all celebrate, where uh, we, Paul tells us that we were dead in trespasses and sins, like dead people don't respond well, we don't accomplish much, we don't live victorious lives. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love for us, he made us alive together with Christ Jesus. And so, like, Paul begins to teach us who we are in Christ and how to live. We're supposed to be imitators of God. Men, thank goodness he gave us some instructions on how to be good husbands and wives, how to be wives. Like, he's talking them through what it looks like to follow Jesus. And then in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, as he concludes the letter, he's going to give them instructions on how to do spiritual warfare. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, he says, Finally... Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And as you've been made alive together with Christ, as you seek to live lives that bring him honor and glory, as you seek to live out the abundant life in him, finally be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then he says this, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. I want to point this out right, right here. The devil is scheming in your life. This isn't Paul saying, hey, this might happen to you one day. You know, you might be one of those families where you experience a little bit of spiritual warfare. Like, this could happen. He's like, this is going to happen. This is assumed in the text that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that the enemy is going to come after you. And so he says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now, the implication that his schemes want to lead you astray, whereas Jesus says, hey, there's two paths in this world. Everybody's walking one of them. There is this broad path. It's got a big, broad gate. It's the broad path most people are walking, and it leads to destruction. But there is a narrow path and a narrow gate, and that path leads to life. The problem is that few find it. So the schemes of the enemy... They're designed to push back against the work of God who made us alive together with Christ and invited us into the abundant life in him. The schemes of the enemy want to lead us off of that narrow path to walk the broad path that's going to lead to our destruction. I want you to know this. It's happening in your life right now. Now, there are three sources of evil, generally why this is classified. Three uh, locations where we're going to experience evil in this life. The first is in the world. Uh, we live in a world that has been broken and scarred by sin. It was perfect. That was the Garden of Eden, right? There was no sickness, no crying, no dying, no shame, no pain, no hurt. Like, uh, they were naked and unafraid. Like, that's how they lived in their life. And so they got to walk with God, talk with God. The earth was perfect, but then sin entered in. Man, creation was shattered by sin. Brother killed brother. Deceit enters into the world. 
pain, shame, harm, brokenness. And today, if you go about in this world, you need to know that evil is all around you. That the ideas and the thoughts and the actions that you're going to experience in this life uh, are likely to be tainted by evil. Uh, Think about it this way. Have you ever really done anything with a pure motive? You know what I mean? Sometimes we even try to do good things in this life, and yet at the same time we're like, boy, I hope she notices. You know, I I just cook my family breakfast, and maybe she'll cook me breakfast sometimes. Or uh, I don't know if she sees me out here slaving and mowing the lawn. Or, you know, like everything we do, we often have these impure motives. And so the whole world has been broken and scarred by sin. And so we experience that as we live in this life. This is 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. He, he tells us the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. For a time, our enemy has been given dominion, in a sense, in this world. To deceive, to accuse, to distract to lead people to destruction. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That's the world that you and I live in. And for us to approach this with a cruise ship mentality that somehow if we just kick back, take life easy, don't worry about it, like let everyone else take care of the things, what you need to know is that the currents of this culture will never lead you closer to Christ. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And so there will be uh, thoughts and values and ideas and actions that happen in this world. They're going to actively seek to lead you away from Christ. You should be skeptical of prevailing ideologies and ideas, thoughts, ways of thinking, worldviews that you see. If you're a good Christian, you're on the alert. You understand this world is not our home. It has been broken and scarred by sin and by evil. And so we ought to be a little bit careful. And it's not just those big bad things where you're like, oh, yeah, if I go along with the world, I might be tempted to murder somebody. Honestly, it's much more subtle than that. You and I will often be tempted to think in the ways that the world thinks. Think of ourselves first rather than thinking of others. Climb the ladder, get the promotion, make the compromise. We'll be often tempted to, to put ourselves first, our own thoughts, our own advancement above other people. Like these things can be really, really subtle. And so evil exists in the world. But there's another one. It also exists in our flesh. James chapter 1 verse 14 says that each one is tempted when by his own, sorry, excuse me. Each one is tempted by, when by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed by his own lust. Did you know that you still have a fleshly nature? That until the day you're reunited with Jesus Christ, you, li- you, you exit this world, you open your eyes in heaven, you're with Christ, you're going to have this sinful nature. And that's why Paul says, like, don't obey the desires of your flesh. Instead, you need to su- submit yourself to the spirit that you might enjoy life. And so there is evil, there is sinful tendencies and desires even within your own flesh. You should be profoundly skeptical of your own fleshly desires. You know this, right? Probably every person in this room is something of a a health and diet expert, right? We all know how we should eat. We should run marathons like Josh Schneider. We should eat vegan diet. I mean, we should eat healthy stuff. And yet, at the same time, our flesh doesn't cry out for exercise and healthy eating. Our flesh cries out... For pie. You know, our flesh cries out for the recliner. Like, you need it. You need to sit down. You need to rest. You need to take it easy. That's our fleshly desires. And in the same way, that manifests itself in every area of our lives. In your marriage, in your parenting, in your job. Man, you want to make it about you. You want other people to serve you rather than to serve them. And so, uh, the world is a place where we encounter evil. And yet we encounter it even in our own flesh, these sinful tendencies and desires. 
when we talk about spiritual warfare, we're talking about the evil that comes specifically from the third source, and that is the devil, the enemy, the demonic realm. Look what Paul says here in verse 12. He says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Can I tell you where Christians have absolutely blown it? I'll be honest, I have blown it here. And if I know you very well, it's probably true of you too. That we often think that the battle that we're supposed to fight, um, or the the enemy that we're going to fight against, has flesh and blood. We often look at our spouse or our coworker or that frustrating family member, that person who's posting on Facebook. We think that's our opponent. That's the enemy. That's the one we're supposed to fight against. And if we fight the wrong battle against the wrong enemy, I want you to know the enemy wins there. There is not a single person in flesh and blood that is our enemy. There is not a single person who is flesh and blood who is our opposition. There's not a single person on this earth who is of flesh and blood who we are supposed to fight against. Oftentimes, the enemy gets Christians really busy, and we think, man, I'm doing it. I've armored up. I'm fighting the battle. I stepped away from cruise ship Christianity, and we think we're really fighting when all we're doing is doing the devil's bidding by fighting against other men and other women. Our battle is not political. Stop fighting that battle. Our battle is not cultural. Stop fighting that battle. When we decide that that's where we're going to leverage our time and our energy and our talents and our influence, we think, hey, I'm going to fight for my party, whichever one. I'm going to fight for my political views, whatever those may be. When, I, when we decide we're going to fight there, we've just taken away from anything we would have in the actual battle that Jesus Christ has called us to fight. The battle that we fight does not exist in flesh and blood. It exists against the powers, against the rulers, against the forces of darkness in the heavenly realms. If you're fighting it with flesh and blood, you're not fighting the spiritual battle. And so we have to be really, really careful. Now, just as an aside, you're allowed to have political views, and you should. You ought to be looking into the Word of God, guided by the Spirit of God, and say, God, how would you have me vote? You should exercise your privilege that we have to vote in our nation. Uh, You should have perspectives on culture. We should know what the truth is and recognize when the culture and the world are telling lies. But they are never our enemy. To the extent that you do anything other than love somebody, you're fighting the wrong battle. So be careful about that because the enemy would wish to distract us. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, when you hear about a battle in the heavenly places, you you might get a little nervous because you're like, okay, what do I do there? Like, how am I supposed to fight that battle? Because I'm pretty fleshly. I can build things with my hands. I can, you know, make words with my mouth. I can write things on a screen. I I know how to kind of utilize my physical body, but how am I supposed to function in this heavenly realm? I don't know if you were here a few weeks ago, but as Paul began his letter to the church at Ephesus, he was really clear to let them know that you have everything you need in Christ Jesus. This is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Where? In the heavenly places in Christ. Man, you're not without weapons. You're not without tools. As a matter of fact, you have everything you need to wage spiritual warfare, to make a difference in the spiritual battle that's ultimately going on. You have been given every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. So the question might be, All right, what are those weapons? And how do we wield them? 
I'm, I'm really glad that you asked that question. It was really good. Uh, look here in verse 13. Paul's going to tell us for the second time today. He says, Therefore, <clears throat> because the battle is spiritual, because the, the thing that's going on, the thing that we're supposed to fight, the, the exercise of spiritual warfare, because it happens in the heavenly realms, he's going to tell us, Therefore, take up the full armor of God. Again, this is not a fleshly thing. This is not done under your own strength. It's not in your own might. It's his strength, his might, his power, his armor. You should do this in submission to Christ. So this, there's this myth that exists out there that God wants to make a Christian strong. Like he wants to build you up and where you're like this really self-sufficient lone ranger Christian who can just handle all the stuff. And that is a lie. God does not want to make you and I strong. He wants to make us dependent. He wants us to exercise that thing where we go to him moment after moment and day after day where we recognize our own weakness but his profound strength. And so we take up the full armor of God so that we will be able to resist the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Men, there is a battle being waged for your family, for your heart, for your time, for your attention, for your devotion. Ladies, there's a battle being waged for your heart, your mind, for your family, for your kids, for your friends. Students, there's a battle being waged. And the enemy wants to deceive you. He wants to distract you. He wants to get you busy about all the wrong things that you miss out on the abundant life that's available to you in Christ Jesus. Therefore, we've got to take up the armor of God. We've got to go to work. We've got to do battle. So in verse 14, he says, stand firm, therefore. You know, let the work of the enemy, the currents of culture, or even the desires of your flesh move you off of this path that you're walking, the narrow path that leads to life. Stand firm, therefore, uh, having girded your loins with truth. And if y'all know Justin Jackson, he's our youth pastor here. Single favorite verse in all of the Bible. Uh, he, he often speaks of girding up your loins. Uh, it's kind of an awkward phrase that we don't understand all that well in our culture. Your Bible translation may say, um, fastening the belt of truth about your waist. Uh, this is what a soldier would do. And, and interestingly enough, it's likely that Paul is writing this from a prison in Rome. And he's looking at a Roman soldier and he's like, how do we fight as Christians? What's it look like for us to fight? And so he's looking at this soldier standing there, and he's like, ah, oh, man, he's got a belt. He's, got the, he's about to start to, to give, use those as metaphors to teach us how we're supposed to fight as Christians. Now, the thing about the belt uh, of truth, the thing about girding up your loins, is this is what you did when it's time for battle. Like, when you were going to kick back and relax as a soldier, like, you kind of loosen the belt, like we do, right, fellas? Like, in the recliner, you, you loosen the belt a little bit. You need to. It's, it's time to relax. Well, what Paul is telling us here is it's not time to loosen up the belt. Instead, it's time to tighten it up. The belt would be the thing which kind of held all of the Roman armor together. It, it was what supported the, the scabbard and the sword. It's what supported the breastplate that the soldiers would wear. And so the belt was a critical piece. And so Paul, in teaching us about this critical piece for us in the fight against the schemes of the devil that we might stand firm, what's the belt? What's that key thing? It's truth. Having girded your loins with truth. I don't think it's any mistake that in our culture today, there is an all-out assault on truth. That somehow... The prevailing voices in culture have convinced themselves that there are hundreds of millions of versions of truth and that they're all somehow valid, that there isn't a standard of truth. There's not a way, a truth, and a life. It's your way, your truth, your life, and it's all somehow equally valid. I don't think that it's any like surprise. We shouldn't be shocked that the enemy has launched this assault on truth. This is what holds everything else together. And yet, let me be honest, church, this is an area where we just let ourselves be driven away, where we let ourselves be duped. Men of God who have been in church for 30 years are like, yeah, I don't really know the Bible. I can't read the Word. 
Like the truth, it's what holds everything together. God has given it to us that we might recognize the schemes of the enemy, the lies that are going to be told to our wives and our kids and ourselves. We've got to get in the word. Jesus is like, hey, you're going to stand firm. It's not going to be scrolling on social media. It's not giving your life to your hobbies. It's the truth. It holds it all together. So I just want to challenge you. Like, don't buy that lie for another minute that you don't have time to spend in the Word of God, that it's not important, that you can't understand. You have been given the Holy Spirit of God. Man, we look to the Word for truth. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I'm the life. And in a world where everything's like, oh, your truth, your thing, we need to know the truth. Not only that we could stand firm, but that we could bear witness to the truth in the midst of a world that's being overtaken by darkness. We're the light, so we've got to know the truth. He goes on talking about those spiritual blessings that we have in the heavenly places. Truth is a gift. It's a blessing from God. And we should wield it. We should know it. We should cherish it. He continues on. He says, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, the truth is the thing that holds it all together. And man, as we go to fight, we go to fight in righteousness. You know, the enemy is, is known uh, not only as the deceiver, but also as the accuser. And oftentimes in your life, the enemy wants to make you ineffective. He wants you to kind of get comfortable, sit back, not do anything. Like, I, honestly, I'm not one of those Christians. I just, I, I'm not sure I could ever share the gospel. And I'm not sure I could live that devoted life to Jesus Christ. And it's all of this constant accusation. He's going to talk about your, your past, your, your weaknesses, what you can't do, what you don't have. And what the Apostle Paul, he's looking at this Roman soldier. He's like, man, look at that breastplate. Man, it protects him from all the attacks of the enemy that would come against him. He's got this breastplate. He's like, for Christians, that's righteousness. Remember whose armor this is? This is God's armor. You know whose righteousness this is? It's Christ's righteousness. He lived a perfect life. Perfect in every single way. That's who you are. That's the gift to you in Christ Jesus. Man, you wield that. You walk in his righteousness. It's who you are, and it's how you and I should live. We have a new nature. We have an opportunity to express that to the world rather than walking the broad path that leads to destruction like constant compromise following after everyone else. Man, we got a breastplate of righteousness. It was given to us by Christ Jesus. It's who you are. You have been made righteous. Don't settle for any of the lies that the enemy would tell you about yourself. You have been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And Paul's just going to keep unfolding these. And some of these are meant to protect us from the attacks of the enemy. And some, we're going to see the, an offensive weapon that we have. But you've been given all this. I want you to know that Jesus Christ wants to begin to use you in this battle today. You're not deficient. You're not hopelessly broken. Like God didn't hold out on you. You have an opportunity to live this abundant life today. And so he says, gird your loins with truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, remember who you are in Christ. And he says, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. A little bit confusing, I'll be honest with you. Shod my feet, preparation of the gospel of peace. And so uh, basically Roman soldiers won a lot of battles because they had better footwear. In the midst of uh, difficult conditions, where the ground was slippery and their footing was uncertain. The Romans had really good quality footwear. Oftentimes they would drive spikes through their shoes to give them a grip on the ground, which means they had a stable footing from which to fight. So Paul's like, shod your feet um, with the preparation of this gospel of peace. That's your stable footing from which you fight. This, this is the thing. You and I were once enemies from God. It's true. When you didn't know Christ Jesus, you were, and what's the scriptures tell you, you were an enemy, you were an object of wrath. But because of the love of God, because of the cross of Jesus Christ, you have been brought near. You have been adopted and made the child of God. We have peace with him. God's not mad at you. He's not disappointed in you. And he doesn't look at you and think, I wish I wouldn't have saved him or her. The gospel has made peace between us and God. That means we have an opportunity to have this relationship with him. 
the stable footing from which we fight is the gospel of peace, which says we get to communicate with God. We get to walk with Him. We're empowered by Him. We have this stable footing of the gospel. He continues, In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows at the evil one. I think it's helpful to learn about the arrows that you tend to be susceptible to. It's helpful to learn the attacks that the enemy often throws at you. As we go throughout this life, and there are difficulties, there's suffering, there are struggles. And after a while of walking with Christ, you kind of learn, man, here's where I have a tendency to struggle. Here's where I have a tendency to fall. When we begin the Christian life, we often think of it kind of like the cruise ship, right? Like Jesus is going to take care of everything. It's going to be perfect. The water is going to be smooth. Like life's going to be good. But then like Christianity uh, meets the real world, right? And, and we're like, oh, No, like Jesus called us to follow after him, and Jesus suffered and died on a cross. So there's suffering, there's difficulty there. And oftentimes, when we start to suffer difficulty, the enemy's quick to whisper in our ear, God's not going to take care of you. I know that his word says this, but maybe he doesn't really want you to live that way. Remember what he did to Eve in the garden? Did God really say... And as we begin to live this Christian life that begins in great faith, like God is who he says he is, and he's going to do everything he said he, would do, he was going to do, I can trust him. Um, when, when our Christian faith meets the real world, sometimes we begin to have these questions. Can I really trust him? If I take that step of faith, is God really going to provide for me? If I help this person that I saw in need, is God really going to provide Is God really going to bless this act of obedience? Is there really life in following Jesus instead? Because the things of the world are going to look really good. And it's the shield of faith. Faith that Jesus Christ is who he said he is. And that he was going to do everything he promised that he would do. That we continue to walk forward and move forward in obedience. It's taking up the shield of faith. The accusations of the enemy... We're just reminded of the truth of God's word, what he says about us, and what he says about God. God is indeed good, even in the midst of your circumstances, in the midst of your loss, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your suffering. God is good, and he's in control, and he's caring for you. So we take up the shield from which we're able to extinguish all the flaming, flaming arrows of the evil one. Verse 17, he says, and take up the helmet of salvation. Helmets protect heads, um, sometimes to varying agree- degrees of effectiveness. Uh, I was playing uh, football in Idabel, Oklahoma, and uh, I was a, uh, a really solid 140-pound defensive end in high school. 140 pounds of fury, that's what I called it. Uh, and I remember in this particular game, if you're a defensive end, you got to look out for a pulling guard. That means a really big dude from the other side of the line um, is, is going to start running really fast. And the guy that normally tries to block you is just going to kind of let you go. And you're going to think, I'm killing it. I'm going to sack quarterback. And as soon as you bust through the line, this guy who is very large and picked up steam is going to ear hole you and try to take you out of the game. Well, you should know this if you're a decent defensive end, uh, but I didn't. I, was, I wasn't all that good. And so I was pretty passionate about making a play, and this guy happened to weigh somewhere like 300 pounds. And I remember getting ear hold. I mean, I got hit really hard in the head, and uh, the world just wasn't the same after that, not for a couple of days even. I, I remember going to the sidelines, and I'm, and I'm just not with it. I, I'm kind of like... Something is really off here. I'm not understanding. Like, my coach is like, why did you line up there? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, I, mean, I just wasn't with it. I got really sick, and, and for several hours, I, th- I had a concussion. What, I got hit in the head, and so uh, it affected everything. Suddenly, I wasn't quite the football player that I, I never was. But anyway, it wasn't going all that well for me. because I got in that, Here's what the enemy often does. And he gets us in these patterns of thinking. Lobs the darts, he whispers the lies. We begin to think according to the patterns of this world. And man, it it affects everything for us. Man, it changes our whole trajectory. 
And we start to, we start, begin to adopt the, the views of this world, the ways of looking at life, understanding the world that are from the enemy and not of Christ. And man, you affect the head, you affect the whole body. But Paul's like, hey, helmet of salvation. And this is who you are in Christ. You've been given this new nature in Him. And you've been saved. You've been called with a holy calling. You're a child of God. Man, begin to live out of that. It's this helmet of salvation that protects us. Like, you are not who you once were. You have a new way of thinking. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul's like, hey, you want to not be conformed to the patterns of the world? You know how we do that? We have to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so we come back to who we are in Christ. We come back to the word. We remember this great salvation. When we kind of get knocked off kilter and life punches you in the mouth, the cross is the constant reminder of the unending love of Jesus Christ for you. Man, when, when things happen and you go through the circumstance, the helmet of salvation is remembering who we are in Christ, what Jesus Christ has done for us. Again, who he is. It's allowing our minds to be renewed in him. And then he says this, when you take up the sword of the Spirit, thankfully, he defines, he says, this is the word of God. That you and I, against the temptation, the schemes of the enemy, which would wish to make us leave, the, the narrow path that leads us to life, and instead to walk this broad path that leads to destruction, he's like, you take up the sword. This is the, the word of God. If you remember when the, the devil took Jesus out to tempt him, and he was offering him, hey, man, I'll give you all that your eyes can see, and he's really trying to tempt Jesus. Do you know how Jesus responded? The word of God. He was quoting scripture. Listen, this is so important for us. Again, that we know the word of God and we wield that truth against the work of the enemy in our lives. That you could be able to speak the truth of the word of God in those tempting and trying difficult situations. We, we tell our community groups here, uh, we want you to counsel each other biblically. Uh, we have a lot of really intelligent people in this church, but the whole of all of our collective thoughts pale in comparison to the word of God. And so while it's okay every now and then to speak words about specific situations, what we want you to do is bring the word of God to bear on the circumstances of life for people who may be, have a, ha, be having a hard time to see it. This is the sword of truth. This is our offensive weapon. Bringing the truth of God's word to bear on our lives. The final thing here in verse 18, Paul says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for the saints. I don't know if you've got all of that. There's a lot of alls there that he just took us through. It's all prayer, all petition, all times with all perseverance. To say it more easily, we pray without ceasing. It's this constant reminder that we're depending upon the Lord Jesus Christ and his strength. Here's what I want for you. Here's what I want for us. And I want us to be men and women of God who follow after Jesus Christ, who don't adopt the cruise ship Christianity mentality, but instead we are warriors for Jesus Christ, that we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. What I want is for you to be a godly man and husband and father. What I want is for our ladies to be godly women and wives and mothers, for our, our young men to follow after Jesus passionately and our young ladies to serve Jesus with their whole hearts. But we've got to lead them. Man, we've, we've been given the tools to wage warfare, to follow after Jesus Christ and to live lives that are going to honor him, to push back the darkness that we could be light in the midst of a world that is full of lies and deception. We don't do it lying down. And it's not going to be comfortable. And it's not going to be easy. But you need to know that Jesus Christ has won this victory for us. And he, he rose from the grave, victorious over the enemy, over sin and death. And he put to shame every ruler and authority, all dominion, like Jesus has risen victorious over that. We have it in him. We've simply got to wield it. And maybe the most pervasive weapon that the enemy has used against us is distraction and apathy and laziness. We're too busy enjoying the comforts of this world. 
to step up and begin to fight. And so today, my plea with you, put on the armor of God that you might stand firm. That you might look back at the end of your life with joy. Because you didn't waste it. You didn't just kind of ride it out. God used you in profound ways to shape this world, to shape our city, to shape your family on behalf of Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me? Oh God, would you use us? Lord, we acknowledge that we are weak. God, we acknowledge that apart from you, we're going to accomplish nothing. But at the same time and in the same breath, we want to acknowledge the overwhelming power of Jesus Christ that now lives within us, that you have blessed us with every blessing in the heavenly realms. God, we have everything we need to stand firm, to be light in the midst of darkness. And so, Father, we pray that you might confront our apathy, that you might confront our, our at times our timidity. But, Lord, may we live this life in power. May we live this life on mission, fighting this battle that's raging all around us. Lord Jesus, we pray over this church that you would protect us from the work of the enemy. We pray that we might wield the gospel of peace, salvation, and truth, righteousness. And God, that you might use us for your glory. I pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.